Hello everyone, my name is Nye Thompson and I'm the musical director and drummer for Christ Church. I am so thrilled to be worshiping with you guys today. It's not often that they allow the drummer to do the call to worship, so I'm taking full advantage of this. There are other team members that also want to meet you, talk to you, and let you know how much they miss you as well. So let's get going so you can see some of our other team members. This is Angelo. So if I make this thing face, it's probably because he did something cold on keys. <laughs> <laughs> so say hello to Angelo Hart. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen. He's like a lighting director and stuff, and he like carves wood also. Like so he's kind of like Thank you. he's useful. And he's also our stage director. Say hello, Matt. Say hello, Matt. This is our resident songbird, Suzanne. Hi. We may or may not have poster for Butterfield, but she does belong to Christ Church Oak Brick, though, nonetheless. So this dude here is kind of like my little brother in reality. We keep him in the basement because in reality, he's a better drummer than me and it makes me feel better about myself. It's the truth, but I do love his little brother. <laughs> now we disappear and go back up to the magical stage. When night is falling, when fear is calming, still you're calling me. When faith is lost and my hope exhausted, you will be my strength. When my mind says I'm not good enough, God, you're enough for me. I've decided I'm not giving up. You won't give up on me. You won't give up on me. Your love is holding on and it won't let go. Your love is holding on and it won't let go I 
morning, Christ Church, and welcome to worship this morning. My name is Suian, and I serve on staff at the church, and I um, have my coffee. I am in my living room, and I am so excited to welcome you this morning. If you have not had a chance to say hello to someone in the chat feature or in the comment section, I would encourage you to do that. Let us know where you're worshiping from this morning. And if you are new, we are especially glad you're here and want to say a special welcome to you. We have a little new here button on our website. If you want to find that and let us know a little bit more about you, we would love to just connect with you. Lastly, it is Memorial Day weekend. I know it doesn't feel like it, but it is. And there are men and women out there who we want to thank this morning. And so if you are a military family joining us today, just thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for being here with us today. And we want to actually start our service by um, saying a prayer for you and your family. So would you join me in a word of prayer? Father God, we are so thankful to come before you this morning and to have the freedom to worship. Lord, we know that freedom would not be possible without so many men and women who have sacrificed so much, Lord, for this country and on our behalf. And so we lift them before you today. Whether they have served in the past or the present, Lord, or maybe those who have given the ultimate sacrifice of their lives that we remember and honor today, Lord, we just, we lift them and their families up to you. We ask that you would be their light and their grace and their protection and their provision today, Lord. Give them the unique blessings that they need, especially during this season. Lord, thank you that as we talk about sacrifice, we cannot do that without thanking you for the freedom that you give us in your son, Jesus Christ, Lord, for the forgiveness of our sins so that we may be free and walk a new life with you. And so, Lord, we thank you for that. We honor these men and women today, Lord, and we continue our worship with one heart and one voice before you this morning. It's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. One of the things that we value here at Christ Church is community. And normally we do that via small group, but we know that looks a little bit different during this season. And so we are offering online connection groups via Zoom that specifically track with our unexpected sermon series on the Book of Ruth. And we offer a couple different days throughout the week. They are from 7 to 8 p.m. And the amazing thing about them is you don't have to do anything. You simply show up, you bring your beautiful self, and you share a little bit about um, what you're learning during this season. And so we would love for you to join us on one of those. You can find out more on our website or check out that link in the comment section and consider joining one of our groups this week. The other thing we have uh, coming up starting June 1st is an opportunity to participate in Financial Peace University. And if you don't know what that is, it is a faith-based workshop in which you can just take inventory of your finances. You can see what you're doing well, maybe some areas where you need to grow. And it's everything from budgeting to retirement to seeing how we can be more generous with what God has given us. Um, Eric and I took the course probably three or four years ago. We were not in financial crisis. You do not have to be to take this. We just had some kids that we were sending to college and we wanted to make sure we were on solid financial ground to do that. And we wanted to make sure as a couple that we were on the same page. And so we learned a lot. We got some great principles and more importantly, we made sure that we had some common language and goals. So we knew how we were going to move into the next phase of our life. So I would highly recommend it. Again, you can learn more by visiting our website or clicking on the link in your comments uh, section, but would love for you to consider joining us for that as well. Lastly, every time during uh, the worship service, we offer an opportunity for you to support the work that Christ Church is doing. And we do this because we cannot do what we do without you. You make such a difference by supporting the life of this church, not only the ministries of Christ Church, but missionaries across the globe, as well as people who are uh, on the front lines of fighting COVID-19 and everywhere in between. And so I'm gonna invite you to consider giving a gift this morning. You can do that by um, texting CCOB or Butterfield to the link on your screen, that number on 
on your screen that's based on which campus you attend. You can also always mail a gift to the church or we have set up some drop boxes on the outside of each location and you're welcome to drop those off anytime throughout the week. But we just appreciate your ongoing support and are, are so thankful for all that you do on behalf of, of us. Uh, we are going to continue our worship by singing a new song, and it's called New Wine. And it's this beautiful song all about uh, how Jesus sacrificed for us. And because of that, we look at our lives and we see what we can offer back to Jesus so that we can become the kind of people that he wants us to become. So as we continue our worship and as you consider giving this morning, um, just sit back and take a listen to this song.
Hey, good morning. It is so awesome to be with you today. I am so glad you could join us for this special time of worship. You know, if you're just joining us this morning, we have been studying over the past few weeks the amazing story of Ruth and Naomi in the Old Testament. Uh, the story of Ruth is sort of like one of those flowers that you sometimes see pushing itself up through a, a little crack in the sidewalk or a wall. Uh, it's bounded on either side by these great granite blocks of history that get recorded in the book of Judges and the book of Samuel. And, and the little book of Ruth just seems strangely out of place, poking up between these two massive other works pinned between the account of the movements of great armies and the doings of leaders in high places, the tale of Ruth seems oddly particular, uh, unusually ordinary in a sense. It's a story about ordinary, regular, rank and file kinds of people, the sort of folks who never or rarely make the news, except maybe as an example of the terrible things that happen to some people. But the story of Ruth is a reminder to those of us that history is not always influenced most by the events that occupy the big popular media or headlines. It's a challenge to the belief that suffering and confusion is necessarily a sign that there's no plan or providence at work and that life is all chaos and randomness in the end. The book of Ruth shows us that oftentimes it's what God does in the life of a single individual maybe not even one whom others regard as significant, that later winds up being the true turning point of history. The book of Ruth shows us that great events and much good news can be built on the shards of dashed hopes and broken hearts. Now, no one looking at the life of Naomi and Ruth in chapter one of this story would be inclined to believe that much good could possibly come of it. Here were women who simply seemed to be casualties of life's tough breaks. In the face of famine, a Jewish woman named Naomi and her husband become refugees in the land of Moab, one of Israel's most bitter enemies. It's a risky prospect to begin with, but then life suddenly turns even worse. Before they can really get a foothold in their new home, Naomi's husband dies. Normally, she'd be able to lean on her sons for help, but they too prematurely die. Living in a strange land with no high prospects for survival, much less success, Naomi decides to pack up and try to make her way back to Israel, her homeland. Her two Moabite daughters-in-law, a woman by the name of Orpah and Ruth, say that they'll go with her. But Naomi protests, insisting that their young people, that their lives don't have to go down the tubes just because Naomi's is ruined. As we said last time, every life is marked by struggles. We may not be able to relate to Naomi and Ruth at every single point, but into most of our lives come tough changes and rough challenges, conflicts, famines, transitions, moves, losses, death, pandemics. What determines the ultimate outcome or the fruit of a life is usually not whether one has been able to escape difficult circumstances like these, but rather what kind of choices one has made in the face of such struggles. Whether you've been able to build again instead of giving up, whether you've been able to forgive instead of harboring bitter resentment, whether you've been able to look for a window where a door has been closed, to dare to love anew when your heart has been broken, to dust yourself off and move on instead of lying buried in the dust forever. The choice to commit to relationships, particularly when that requires sacrifice, is one of the most influential of all choices that one can make. And it's that choice that shines as the awe-inspiring light in the midst of the darkness of chapter one, as we saw last week. Uh, when she had every reason and opportunity and actually a lot of encouragement to leave her mother-in-law behind, to go live out her own miserable future on her own, the Moabite woman we call Ruth made the choice to faithfully care for Naomi to the very end. 
And you may remember that incredible statement we read last week when Ruth replies to Naomi, don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you for where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. And your people will be my people and your God will be my God. For where you die, I will die and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me May he deal with me ever so severely, if anything, but death separates you and me. Now, as we explored last week, Ruth gave up in this action her family of origin, and she went to where she had no family. She gave up her native country to enter into the country of an enemy. She gave up a place where there was plenty of food to go to one that might have much food. She gave up her best remarriage prospects for a situation where her prospects were slim, if not none. And she did all of this for a mother-in-law, a mother-in-law so bitter and depressed that she makes Debbie Downer look cheerful. Now in this way, Ruth foreshadows the indefatigable faithfulness and the sacrificial love of someone who would one day cross an even greater distance and give up even more privilege and comfort in order to demonstrate his care for his adopted family. But we're getting ahead of the story as we go there. Chapter one just ends with Naomi and Ruth trudging back across the Moabite desert and over the Jordan River and up into the hill country south of Jerusalem where stood a small village you might have heard of called Bethlehem. We're told that they arrived just as the barley harvest was beginning, as it says in the last verse of chapter one. So let's uh, pick up the story there in chapter two at verse one. Now, Naomi had a relative on her husband's side from the clan of Elimelech, a man of standing whose name was Boaz. Now, This is an interesting start to this portion of the story, I think. Although we don't actually meet Boaz for several more verses, he gets mentioned right up front here to indicate the radical turn of events that God is bringing about. Chapter one, as you'll recall, has been about the progressive death and disappearance of men. (laughs) It's been about the loss of men upon whom the heroines in the story had wanted to be able to depend. Even the very names of the men who have been in Naomi and Ruth's life thus far suggest the fragility of those men. Malon, one of the brothers, literally means sickly one. The name Kilion, the uh, other son, means pining one. In acting in faith and love towards Naomi, Ruth had surrendered almost any hope of ever marrying again. But chapter two begins by suddenly turning the tables unexpectedly. It starts by introducing a whole new man into the story, a relative of Naomi's dead husband, whose name was Boaz, which literally means he who comes in strength. Remember that, because at least poetically speaking, it proves to be very significant later on. Now, Boaz and Ruth have something in common, even before they're introduced to each other. For one thing, they are both people who move through life with a gracious kind of strength. But there's a second connection there too. Both of these people come from colorful families, as it were, Uh, the kind of very imperfect families that I'm gonna guess the neighbors in their area would probably whisper about. As Sue Ann reminded us last week, the Bible keeps repeating that Ruth is a Moabite, as if that makes her an unlikely hero in the story. And it really does. We've already told you that as a Moabite, Ruth is from a nation that is regarded as a mortal enemy of Judah. It's the place where she's now gone with Naomi to live. But being a Moabite also means that Ruth is a direct descendant of Lot, the infamous nephew of Abraham, whose life and wife was very well associated with Sodom and Gomorrah, history's ultimate sin cities. Boaz comes from a sullied lineage too. 
Uh, His mother was Rahab, a famous Canaanite prostitute whose principal positive quality was that she harbored some Israelite spies when they were out scouting the city of Jericho for conquest. So I'm hoping that you're getting this picture. Neither Ruth nor Boaz was exactly pure-blooded aristocrat by any standard of that day. They are, in fact, both unexpected heroes. They're a reminder that human pedigree is never actually a stopper when it comes to exercising God's power and plan. And that's good news, I think, because some of us have a pretty checkered history and family life too, don't we? I I know I can relate to that. So in any event, the, the two women arrive hungry from their long journey. And Ruth the Moabitess said to Naomi, the text says, let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favor. Naomi said to her, go ahead, my daughter. And so she went out and began to glean in the fields behind the harvesters. Now, this mention of gleaning is a really interesting cultural detail. It's actually also an important plot prelude, and it is a very significant pointer to the heart of God. God's law in that time specifically mandated that when people were out harvesting their fields, they should not go back and pick up the grain that got dropped in the natural process of cutting and gathering the principal part of the harvest. Why was that? Why why this apparent act of waste? Well, it was because God intended to build a natural charity into the balance of Israel's life. The, The droppings that got left behind in the harvesting process were to be left for the poor to come along behind and pick up so that they too might be fed. It was actually an incredibly beautiful system. The first harvesters were spared the hassle of cleaning up behind themselves, and the second harvesters had something with which to feed their families. Everybody won, in a sense. I want to contrast that particular vision and standard with an orchard near where my wife Amy and I used to live in Southern California. Uh, We lived for a number of years uh, in a very uh, beautiful community outside of San Diego. And the orchard that I'm speaking of was owned by the diet maven, Jenny Craig. It was right next to this incredible landscape of gullies and arroyos where literally hundreds of the Mexican families who took care of Rancho Santa Fe's fabulous gardens and homes had uh, taken up a life in pretty tough conditions. And I'll never forget the sight of all of the fallen fruit beneath the trees in this massive, beautiful uh, orchard. And that fruit just sat there, rotting on the ground behind these really high fences while the kids next door went hungry. God intended something better than that for the human community. And I want to celebrate those of you whose really generous commitment to our food and our supplies drive and to the resourcing of the church through these past weeks and months and in these days to come of summer. I want to celebrate your heart that you definitely get godly stewardship and that you understand that it implies both a commitment to giving the first fruits of our life to God and also the gleanings to take care of the least of Christ's brothers and sisters. This, of course, still leaves us with more than a generous middle portion to enjoy for ourselves. In any case, I I want to invite you to picture Ruth out there in the fields of Bethlehem. She's following along behind the first harvesters. She's gathering up the leftovers in her apron. And the Bible goes on to say, as it turned out, She found herself working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. Now, I want you to key in on that first phrase, as it turned out. It kind of sounds like a blithe statement about the randomness and chance occurrences of life. 
but it isn't. It's actually a confession of wonder at the fact that somehow amidst the often chaotic flow of events, the things that happen uh, actually suggest there's an architect, there's a conductor, there's a tapestry weaver at work behind the scenes of life. I invite you to think of how many times you've actually used that phrase yourself. My life story is punctuated significantly with that phrase. My life, as some of you know, came crashing down when I was 17. But as it turned out, that collapse made me open to seeking more dependable foundations for my life. Uh, My dad forced me to go to a Christian conference when I was 18. I was so enraged. But as it turned out, I became a follower of Jesus there. I I remember losing a coveted job in England after I got out of college Uh, just two weeks after graduating from school. But as it turned out, the loss of that job led me to Belfast, Northern Ireland, and to an experience that redirected my entire vocation from politics towards the work that you suffer with me doing now. I went on a blind date one night that was foisted upon me by a very annoying friend. But as it turned out, that was the night I met my wife, Amy. The next time you're despairing over some circumstance in your life, make a list of the as it turned outs in your story and let the knowledge of this this providence grow your trust in the hand of God. The texts say that just then, Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters. The Lord be with you, he said to them. The Lord bless you, they called back. And Boaz asked the foreman of the harvesters uh, and, and said, whose young woman is that? Whose young woman is that? Now, I love the sheer beauty and the humanity of that exchange. Boaz arrives and he starts talking as as he was probably in the habit of doing with the guys on the harvesting crew. And in mid-sentence, he spots the curve of a form or a face he's never seen out there before. And he goes slack-jawed for a moment. Uh, or who's that? I, I mean, who's she married to? And then he grins as he notices she's not wearing a ring. I don't know, maybe I'm reading a a little bit too much into the story here. Maybe I've just watched one too many rom-coms during quarantine. Perhaps Boaz just noticed a stranger on the work crew and he asked a perfectly natural question. But whatever the case, the foreman replied, she is the Moabitess who came back from Moab with Naomi. She said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the harvesters. And she went into the field and has worked steadily from morning till now, except for a short rest in the shelter. I suppose that Boaz might just have been impressed with Ruth's amazing work ethic, or maybe with her gleaning technique. Uh, I remember reading in the autobiography of Watergate conspirator G. Gordon Liddy that he had selected his wife, and I quote, for her excellent bone structure and fine math skills. Somehow, I I suspect that Boaz's care ran a little bit deeper than that. And, And so the scriptures say that Boaz said to Ruth, my daughter, my daughter, a term of respect, listen to me. Don't go and glean in another field and don't go away from here, but stay here with my servant girls. Watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow along after the other girls, I have told the men not to touch you. And whenever you are thirsty, go and get a drink from the water jars the men have filled. I want you to think about what these words must have meant to Ruth. She was hungry and thirsty in a way that probably not a lot of us have ever been after a very long 
painful journey. She was far away from her family, from her country of origin. She was a despised Moabite in the land of Israel. She was justifiably afraid of being brutalized in a world where women were often raped and abused without a second thought. She was trying to scrape out just one more day of mere existence if she could. And then into her life comes this stranger who displays an unexpected character. A strong, tender kindness, an unexpected grace. Something like the character Ruth had shown to Naomi. At this the text says, Ruth bowed down with her face to the ground. And she exclaimed, why have I found such favor in your eyes that you notice me a foreigner? In various forms, it strikes me that this is the question whose cousins populate the rest of scripture, and I might add the entire history of the church. This is the very surprise that leaps up in the hearts of many a people. You want me, a murderer, to represent you before Pharaoh, asks Moses of God. You are mindful of me, O majestic Lord of the infinite heavens, inquires David. You've chosen me, a man of unclean lips, to reveal your glory to, asks Isaiah. You've selected me, a mere peasant girl, to bear the Messiah, wonders Mary. You want to have lunch at my house with me, a tax collector, asks Zacchaeus. You would give living water to me, says the woman of Samaria at the well. You would touch me, replies the leper. You would kill the fatted calf and throw a party for me, father, asks the prodigal son. You would have me as your apostle, inquires Saul, who would become Paul, the Christian killer. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood, the hymn writer asks, died him for me, who caused his pain for me, who him to death pursued. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst care for me? Beloved, this this is the great message of the gospel. God delights in blessing and blessing others through those whose humility prevents them from seeing why they should ever be worthy of such blessing. Maybe you're somebody like that. Ruth is definitely someone like that. She's chosen to live by the rule of grace towards others in a way that makes those who value grace want to just pour more of it out upon her. And Boaz replies in this story, I've been told all about what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband and how you left your father and mother and your homeland and came to live with a people you did not even know before. Boaz says, may the Lord repay you for what you have done, Ruth. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you've come to take refuge. We're being told here that that the concern of Boaz definitely goes beyond, or maybe entirely transcends at this point, a merely romantic interest in Ruth. Boaz sees in the faithfulness of Ruth an unexpected character that he knows God would honor, God would want to see built up. And and she responds, may I continue to find favor in your eyes, my Lord, for you have given me comfort 
and have spoken kindly to your servant, though I do not have the standing of one of your servant girls. And thus begins the remarkable love story, the relationship of Ruth and Boaz that we'll come back to next week. At mealtime, Boaz says to her, uh, Ruth, uh, come here, have some bread and dip it in the wine vinegar. And when she sat down with the harvesters, he offered her some roasted grain and she ate. She ate all that she wanted and had some left over. And as she got up to glean, Boaz um, gave orders to his men, even if she gathers among the sheaves, don't embarrass her. Even if she makes mistakes and goes where she's not supposed to go, don't embarrass her. She's got a great heart. Rather, pull out some of the stalks for her from the bundles and leave them there for her to pick up and don't rebuke her. So Ruth gleaned in the field until evening and then she threshed the barley she had gathered and it amounted to about an ephah. An ephah is a significant amount and she carried it back to town and, and her mother-in-law saw how much she had gathered and Ruth also brought out and gave her what she had left over after she had eaten enough. I want you to think about the abundance that we're ha- hearing described here and how much it contrasts with the state that Ruth was in prior to her decision to be faithful to be sacrificial in the commitment she made to Naomi. This sort of scenario, this sort of amazing turn of events is one of the consistent messages of scripture. In the prophet Malachi's writing, God promises to bless beyond imagination those who are faithful even to the point of great sacrifice. In fact, God says in his word, Test me in this. Test me, says the Lord God Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. Live in the way that I live. Live with kindness and and love and generosity and trust me, I'll take care of you. You will not have enough room for the grace I'll pour out to you. In Philippians Chapter 2 in the New Testament, elsewhere, God promises to exalt those who humble themselves in the service of other people. Well, in this instance, Ruth's mother-in-law, Naomi, is just stupefied by the amount of blessing. And her mother-in-law asked her, where did you glean today? <laughs> Where did you go to work? But blessed be the man who took notice of you. Why is it that we're so often shocked when virtue is unexpectedly rewarded? Then Ruth told her mother-in-law about the one at whose place she'd been working. The name of the man I worked with today is Boaz, she said. Oh, the Lord bless him, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law. He has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead. Remember this uh, from the last chapter. This is a turnaround for Naomi now. She had been so bitter. She was so convinced God had given up caring for her. And yet she's now giving him praise for showing kindness to the living and the dead. And then she added, that man is our close relative. He is one of our kinsmen redeemers. Then Ruth the Moabitess said, he even said to me, stay with my workers until they finish harvesting all of my grain. Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, Oh, it will be good for you, my daughter. It will be good to go with his girls because in someone else's field, 
you might be harmed. So Ruth stayed close to the servant girls of Boaz to clean until the barley and wheat harvests were finished. And she lived with her mother-in-law. I want to just leave you with a couple of thoughts as I send you today out into the remainder of your week. I want you to take these thoughts with you. But I want to invite you to consider these thoughts in the form of a few questions. The first question is this. How have you experienced God's providential care as it turned out? It looked bad, but as it turned out, you experienced his care. Write down that list. Praise God for this. Keep it close to your heart when times are tough. Secondly, are there any difficult changes or challenges that you are facing right now in which you might dare to more fully trust God's goodness and wait upon the unfolding of his plan the way Ruth did? And thirdly, if you believe that grace truly begets even greater grace, then in what relationships or situations of your life right now might you demonstrate additional sacrificial grace in the days ahead. Fourthly, in what ways does Boaz, the kinsman redeemer, foreshadow or prefigure the ministry of someone else who adopts the faithful into his family and redeems them? You see, this story of Ruth and Boaz points us to the greatest story of all, to the story of an even more unexpected character who will change all of life. So come on back next week as we continue to discover that truth. Please pray with me. Lord God, thank you for the testimony of your faithfulness and for the way that your very character fills the heart and lives and moves through the lives of those who open themselves to you. Help us to be ones who so open ourselves to you. For we pray in the name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen.
Thanks once again for sharing in this important time of worship. I hope that you have found the Lord touching your heart through the songs we've sung, uh, through the prayers we've prayed, and through the opening of his word. As you go out now into the rest of your week, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord our God shine his face upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace this day and his joy forevermore. Amen.